one and all welcome to the biotech podcast uh today we're going to be talking about something that's very close to my heart which is wildlife conservation specifically technology and emerging technologies have played such a massive and exponentially impactful role in so many industries both in the public and private sector but one area in which this transformation is not as evident is wildlife conservation and we are joined by someone who is a valued member of the conservation community in india and someone who can shed some light on this for us so dr anish anderia who is the president of the wildlife conservation trust in india he's joining us today for this episode dr anish if you could just give us a brief overview of who you are and what is your work at wct what do you actually do with your professional time thank you kavya i'm happy to be here i work with the wildlife conservation trust and this is a not for profit that was set up in way back in 2002 however the field operations started in 2009 i was the first employee there and now we've grown into a 95 employee organization and we work in uh, several states what with a lot of focus in, on conservation issues in central india but we work in nearly 23 states we work very closely with um, the government because wildlife as a subject conservation and and protection that subject is um, uh, something which is a it's a concurrent field both center and state have a big role to play so ngos can come up with solutions but to scale up those solutions you will have to partner with the government and so we work closely with the state and the central governments but we also partner with a lot of other organizations and uh, even uh, educational institutes because uh, as you know we are just 95 people and we cannot know everything and so partnerships is how we fill in the gaps that exist in the organization but i'm very very happy and proud to have a team that's extremely dedicated um, and they uh, use science hard science to to understand the system and to come up with recommendations so that nobody can refute it so that's why wct um, f- over the last um, nearly 20 14 years uh, has been um, you know advising the government and also forming consortiums with ngos to provide the scientific know how about the ecosystems that we work in so research as i understand it is a a functional part of wct's work is that right uh, yes. okay yes of course so uh, conservation in general is it a sort of straightforward discipline is it a science that can be quantified and deployed is there tricky and complicated aspects of conservation that need sort of collaboration and other things as well you know people have a wrong notion about conservation wildlife sciences uh if you are looking at uh, say people who are who love nature uh, and then they want to do something about it people start working volunteering interning they start uh, you know a lot of people uh think that they can just because of the passion that they have they can start contributing to conservation but that's uh, often times not true you can but as a volunteer you can do piecemeal stuff and uh, people should do that to understand the system well so volunteering with good organizations is always a good idea however conservation is an extremely uh, it's a complex uh, field uh, a you are working in multiple sectors so conservation is nothing but consumption of natural resources in a sustainable manner and so uh, it is not something that only a biologist can do so that's one myth that i must i should clear here people think you know conservationists are all wildlife biologists not not so i mean it was true uh, about 50 60 years ago but now pretty much anybody uh, with good knowledge of what what they've learned is good enough because you are on one side understanding law that is the uh, wildlife law the the forest conservation acts and all that to understand what is allowable what is not allowable what is a national park what is a sanctuary what is you know all that on the other side you need to understand social sciences because you don't 
you may be interested in a species that you want to conserve, but you don't interact with that species as such. As a scientist, you may go in and look at that species, observe that species, take some notes and infer certain things about a species, but there is no direct communication with the species as such. So to conserve a landscape or to conserve a species, you are working with communities because India is 1.4 billion strong uh, country. It's, it's highly dense when it comes to human populations. Um, there are wild spaces in India, but they are being, you know, in a way engulfed by a sea of human beings. And the biggest problem with uh, uh, wildlife and, and and the landscapes is the consumption uh, of human beings, the way they consume natural resources. Uh, cities become the big center where a lot of carbon is utilized. And finally, you have uh, all the pressure falls onto ecosystems because A, we are agrarian in a big way. More than 60% of Indians are farmers still. So they need water. Water is all surface water. And they, it's all being manufactured by or captured by the mountains and the forests. So if you don't have good quality forests, you will not have good quality water or uh, enough water. So the, the pressures of an urban environment falls onto the ecosystems. The pressures of people who live alongside the forest, they are the poorest of the poor, really. And they have to depend on the forest for subsistence, which means they go and collect firewood to cook food. They have to uh, depend on for protein needs. They come sometimes go in and for collecting honey. And there are so many things. The minor forest produce fruits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so there is huge pressure, biotic pressure from humans uh, and their livestock, because India has the highest density of livestock. And so all these cows, buffaloes, sheep, goats are also a lot of them are free ranging. I'm talking about the states where there is forest. A lot of people just sent off their cattle into the forest for grazing in the night. They bring them back. So they are competing with nature. So you have communities influencing the forest. You have cities putting pressure. You are, There is a law on one side. Then there is technology, which means uh, as a people who understand science can use that technology to understand the system, right? Uh, so it's a, and, and then you have the government, you have the politics because local level politics sometimes is, is unsurmountable. It's almost impossible to uh, overcome uh, problems that happen there. So it logically, you can easily conserve certain things, but because of ulterior motives, because of conflict of interest of people, especially uh, local level politicians, it is almost impossible to protect that land. And so politics. So, uh, so there is a huge gamut of fields that one need to understand to be able to work in the field. So I think conservation uh, per se is an extremely uh, complex and you need thorough professionals uh, to work for it. The income, the salaries have lately gone up. However, it still cannot be compared with other professions. Um, and so you need highly motivated or passionate people. Um, and so passion with knowledge and with a 360 degree approach is how conservation programs can be sustained and also be successful. And so I think, um, yeah, it's it's quite something. So a lot of people call me saying that, hey, I'm a IT person, but now now realize after five years in the industry that I don't like it. I love uh, wildlife. What can I do? So it's like this: you can you can't wake up one morning and say, hey, I'm uh, a scientist, but I've realized that I have a passion for open heart surgery, and I call the top MD and say, hey, uh, I want to, uh, you know, I love, I want to do that. So can I join you and do it? You can't. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In conservation also, you can't really just go and start off. So my suggestion to a lot of people always, in the conservation field or in uh, these enthusiasts who call me is to go and first read a lot. There's a lot of information today. There is social media. You understand a lot of things. Then volunteer. If possible, if you are in the right age, actually there is no age barrier, but in the mind you have because you are earning already in a, from a different profession. So then you, then you go and, uh, you know, uh, build capacity. So you go and do a master's program. 
some masters program uh, are 11 month master programs to understand so they can bridge the gap that exists and then go and work in an organization don't expect to earn big money straight away and so you will have patience you will need patience you will have to let go of some of your income and you will have to work very hard if you want to suddenly get into conservation but there is uh, fortunately when i started that was way back in 1980s um there was hardly any information but today i see a lot of young people 22 year old 21 year old 20 year old who have already started um, to go and collect Uh, information and also build capacity so that they can become conservationists in the future so you see a lot of change now but uh, as i said it's it's not that easy you must really be passionate to be able to do something uh, in the long run yeah and uh, you mentioned in the middle that there were you know incomes have gone up and things like that in the wildlife conservation space largely it is driven by ngos non profits uh, that have you know a deep connections with the central and state government they working together but is there a sort of private sector or are there startups like in wildlife as well is there a private sector in india for wildlife conservation so there are some technologists uh, who are um, see startups can come in but there has to be market mm. so you cannot have a startup that's addressing a niche problem which is and there are not many takers for it so i mean for wct you cannot set up or no nobody can say okay i want to help wct let me set up a startup because who is going to buy that product other than a handful of organizations in india so uh, directly into conservation uh, not so much but uh, i see that in future certain technologies say for instance camera trapping so can i will talk about it uh, as we progress uh, in this discussion but so camera trapping you need um, certain modifications in there so there are technologists who are silently supporting organizations like ours where they kind of we tell them about the problem and they say okay so these are consultants they don't do it in a commercial way obviously uh, they get consultancy from us but it's not like a big scale uh, uh, you know projection that we go to do this so they do it for a niche market so basically you just uh, work with them as and they will come on board they will understand your problem and they'll try and find technological solutions so that's the model that currently we are on but uh, you don't know you know things move very rapidly and i am very i'll be happy if uh, you know conservation becomes um, an extremely uh, you know sought after field in the future we'll have we'll be forced to do that but i hope it happens before it's too late true that true that uh, there is a lot of interest like in environment and wildlife especially i've seen it as a journalist as well in the past 5 years especially there's so much engagement from both the public uh, newsrooms social media like lots of people are talking about it even outside the wildlife conservation community so there is some hope that uh, what you want and what i want also will happen in the next few years so let's see um what are the kind of technologies that you do use or rather india does deploy apply in wildlife conservation today like uh, we'll talk about the future later but currently where are the sort of what are the areas of conservation where technology is being used we have to understand that technology was never de- developed for the wildlife sector so it was developed for military camera trapping drones gis a uh, remote sense data that the satellites are collecting that's all done for uh, you know uh, prospecting for minerals understanding how the weather how the sea contours are a lot of other things weather and so on so a lot of these technologies are borrowed from other fields that we must uh, uh, you know first place on the table as wcp we are working on several projects uh, these are all very i mean long term projects so there are different things that we do we use drones to look at ecosystems either to see animals or to you can also use them to count animals that's one then you use ai based technology to uh, you know uh, improve your systems for instance to predict uh, you know consumption so if you are studying you do a, a survey which is very very uh, extensive um you know some of our surveys uh, say about families so when we go and talk about socio economic surveys uh, 
we are collecting uh, nearly 700 to 800 parameters per family. And if you are working with say 10,000 families, so you'll have just think of an Excel sheet with 10,000 um, families as your rows and the columns will be seven, 800. That's so my that kind of wow. So that you cannot do without technology. So you have to use machine learning. You have to use, uh, you know, you have to be able to, because see, big data is important to find the needle in the haystack. It was not possible in the past. Now, so we used to ignore the needle and then, you know, get a puncture wound someday. So now when you're working in conservation, you need to understand what you really want to understand. You cannot say, oh, it's very difficult to understand. So that's where your that the data crunching part is important for which obviously the machines are there now. We partner with, uh, say, Google, for instance, to utilize their, uh, uh, you know, um, the capacity of their machines to be able to analyze our data. So that again, then uh, camera trapping, which everybody talks about, it's a high, it's used by the government to estimate tiger densities, but they, that can be used for many more things. So that we are using uh, how many animals live per 100 square kilometers and especially those animals that have pattern on the body. So every tiger, for instance, you see the tiger there, uh, that tiger is going to be different from all other tigers if you just look at the stripes on the body. So once you have a photograph of a tiger from both flanks, right and uh, left, that those two flanks make one ID. And so that tiger then becomes unique ID. So like you have a UID, you have UIDs for tigers that's collected through camera trapping. But camera trapping can be used in different ways. So we are using camera trapping in several uh, other things. We can come to that later because it's non-intrusive. You put the camera there for 45 days, collect that camera or maybe just check your batteries if the batteries are okay or replenish them and then collect that data that again goes into the computer and and uh, there again you need technology ai assisted technology to sift through millions of images to segregate tiger images from other images i remember when we did the same thing about eight ten years ago uh, it used to be taking us about one and a half months to just go and segregate images that are thousand cameras are collecting for 45 days only now all that happens like this because the it's a train system so all the empty misfired uh, pictures are removed then all the four legged animals are segregated two legged because there are a lot of people walking into the forest that we are working in certain corridor area so you have people so those are segregated. Then you get into the tiger space. And once you see the tiger visually, because tigers you don't have in large numbers, so it's easy. Once they are segregated, then it can even match their, uh, there's a morphing software, which can actually, if it's a cub or all animals can are made into a standard size and their stripes in a certain area are map, matched. And they will tell you uh, similar matching animals. So, so that way, that uh, understanding because of machine learning, has also expedited the area that we can cover now because the data can we don't need a downtime people can just keep moving cameras and data can be analyzed so that we do the so population estimation is one thing but when you want to understand behavior you cannot do it through camera traps sometimes you get some anecdotal information or some information say of uh, animal behavior through cameras but mostly it is done with the help of tagging so for instance there's an animal that has entered a village. People have got scared. Uh, the forest department has gone and rescued that animal. Now, you, you so if the animal is not, if that tiger or leopard has not killed anybody, um, obviously that animal needs to be released somewhere. But there is always a doubt in the mind of people involved whether this animal is used to people and that wherever you release that animal is going to go out. So people can be outraged and they'll say, we don't want you to release. Once you catch this animal, just keep it in the cage. We don't want the problem. So now those kind of situations in the past, we couldn't do much. Now we say, don't worry, we are putting a tag. So that tag can actually send signals to the satellite. The satellite then sends signal to the receiver and you can actually track the movement of the tiger. Right? So there is a VHF where you can actually follow the tiger even without seeing him or her if she is in the vicinity, say, depends on the terrain and everything. But 
so even if they are say 500 meters away it will give you a signal in that direction so you know what is happening plus there is a gps attached satellite so that so then there is a scholar that will have a gps so it will actually plot so if you uh, set timing on that collar you can say i want to know uh, where the tiger is every 20 minutes and then once you know that the tiger is stabilized that's it's not going to the village or around any other village then you can increase the time to say one signal per two hours because the battery life depends on how many signals that uh, uh, the tag can give and so those kind of things are possible remotely another thing in the radio coloring uh, thing is that you have radio colors that can drop off so there is a charge in the screw and you can remotely just by pressing a button order the collar to fall off because you don't want the collar to be sticking around the uh, the animal beyond uh, the necess the data that you want so if i get a a trajectory of the tiger so the tiger is walking and it's uh, gone and we have collected data for 6 months that trajectory has no use if it is not superimposed with the terrain right so then you are using satellite imaging so there is satellite imagery available so for instance google earth google earth is giving you live image so it's in the hands of everybody so anybody who owns a phone has access to uh, a smartphone has an access to google earth and google earth is giving you live locations right you you're traveling in the city now we really don't pause anywhere and ask for directions anywhere you go in india your phone tells you where you are so the same technology is used in case of wildlife where the map that you made has been superimposed so there are kml files which you superimpose on the google earth image so you know now with the topography the villages the roads everything and then you have a tiger uh, movement pattern that way you can actually estimate the range of the tiger as to in couple of years or it's in 6 months time how much area has the tiger covered not just the distance but area as well approximate so that gives you a lot more information i'm just giving you information about tigers but the same thing can be used on elephants the collars will be bigger and elephants are creating uh, some confusion in people because they have no uh, place to go uh, their forests have been depleted their corridors have been destroyed and so uh, elephants are creating a havoc nearly 400 or about more than 400 people die every year because of elephant attacks and nearly 100 elephants die because of conflict where either they are run down by a train or uh, they are poisoned or they are electrocuted or they are killed right so 400 plus people 100 plus elephants and so if you put a collar on an elephant that's used to going into a, a crop field so if he is a compulsive crop raider uh, generally male elephants uh, tend to you know get used to easy food and so they will go close to the village they don't get scared of anything so if a collar is placed the collar will give information the villagers can be prepared that this animal is coming in and so there can uh, so if there are people working in the village or are moving around they can uh, go back into their houses and so just by doing that uh, negative interactions between wildlife and people can be stopped so this remote sense data is also something that we are using elephants are getting run down by trains every year you'll have several incidents especially in the northeast uh, west bengal and assam and several of these uh, these areas where uh, you know they get just mowed down um so there is, there are technologies wherein you can you will know where the train is so if you there is an approaching train that message goes by wireless to a device which is placed in the corridor that cuts through the thing and the, if the train is say 5 minutes away there will be a signal that signal will trigger an alarm it could be a light alarm along with sound which could be really loud close to the thing so that animals don't come in that particular uh, accident prone segment of the railway track from deaths in the past you know that there are certain areas either because of the topography uh, before or after this particular spot that animals like to use that area maybe a water body on the other side or maybe it's a valley and so elephants will not walk on the slope they will try to go on flat surfaces so they can walk faster or there could be food that's available on on the way so these factors from gis work from remote sense data you will know the movement of the elephants you know because of deaths you know 
then you set this up and you have an alarm so and it gives an alarm maybe 5 6 7 10 minutes beforehand so the animals will disperse from their area so those kind of technologies we are working on then there are uh, the government has deployed what is called ei ei is basically nothing but a a camera that's raised uh, to say a few i think about 20 meters or so beyond uh, or it's on a hill or on certain areas from where it can actually rotate so it will go on this axis move almost 360 degrees and there is uh, both a thermal camera and an infrared camera in it right so in the night by the difference uh, from the difference in temperature of a hot warm bodied animal so in the winter uh, months in the night the temperature is low so if a tiger or a human being walks you can actually see almost 2 kilometers on all directions so those ei those cameras will constantly keep a vigil on that particular landscape so almost like a 2 2 to 5 uh, 2 kilometers on either side okay and so those could be install again those are expensive things it can go to a crore of rupees uh, to set something like this plus you will have a control room and finally it will send you information but somebody on the ground will have to go and do something there right so it's not just looking so all these technologies that i'm saying they cannot replace human beings these can only help human beings but if humans had to do it the accuracy will go down and the amount of energy will be too much so it's a cost effective way but there is no replacement or no replacing the what the guards and the watchers have to do on the ground so the forest department or anybody for that matter has to make sure that the information that technology is giving you percolates down and then that transforms into uh, a solution so this ei is can help you because they are expensive but in certain areas which are prone to uh, some issue maybe poachers going in those can be used uh, in those areas it can be set up and so in some places they have done we have not done anything in it but the government has done it it's a very expensive thing to do then we have a forensics department so uh, forensics again it's a technology that we uh, human beings have used uh, to to unravel the secrets behind a crime now same technology can be used for wildlife crime so if somebody goes and hunts down an animal uh, there is no witness so in when it comes to human uh, crime you know there are cctv cameras everywhere people see people can talk people will there will be witnesses but in the jungle if somebody goes and cuts a tree it's almost there is no other tree who's seeing it is not going to tell you that i know the guy he yeah. comes here he wears a pink lungi so <laughs> and you cannot there are traps everywhere right yeah, yeah, and so yeah. that science makes uh, a lot of sense because many of our cases so india the conviction rate in in the wildlife sector uh, or in wildlife crime actually is less than 5% so every 100 cases booked only 5% really get solved solve meaning get a, a positive thing where the uh, the criminal is actually either fined heavily or is behind bars so to improve the conviction rate tech, uh, forensics because there is no witness and some witnesses will turn hostile so i may be there at on crime i may say something but because the judicial process is so slow that by the time the actual case comes and i have to go to the court i have been either fixed by paying money or you know uh, uh in a way want to not go against it so a lot of these witness will turn hostile but if you use technology like like if like dna fingerprinting like animal you know certain technologies that then it becomes unambiguous uh so there was a case on lions and some 35 lions were hunted down in gujarat now not hunted down they died um and uh, the government didn't know what was happening they wanted to Uh, understand so they put the cbi there and uh, they started investigating and after a month almost 40 days later they found lion blood inside the nail of uh, uh, people wow okay. okay wow because i mean it talks volumes about the unhygienic lifestyle of the person but uh, you know a lot of these tribes that live in the open obviously uh you know so so just from the nail and that too after a month 
they could find la, lion uh, uh, blood and then obviously that's how they could rope in so forensic science then genetic science is an amazing uh, field that is so before genetic technology came up uh, uh, people believed that uh, birds are monogamous largely 95% of the species are monogamous now we know that pretty much 99% of birds are polygamous because what you see is not what's happening there so you see a male and a female the female on the nest and the male feeding it but uh, uh, you don't know that's what you see and because again it's also to do with our conditioning so it that is an era where uh, you know there was a taboo and so scientists also were not beyond all that so they saw what they believed in now with genetic science from the dna taken out of the chicks you can tell that whether they are born out of the same father or not right so from neighboring nests within an area of 2 or 3 square kilometers the male was having two or three eggs uh, two or three nests that he was visiting right and so uh, genetic t- technology has also made us understand how nature functions but it's also played a very big role in taxonomy so for instance and that is very relevant to conservation for instance there is a frog in say western ghats and it's seen in uh, certain mountains of kerala and it is seen similar frog is seen in karnataka as well and in tamil nadu uh, so in the past people identified that frog as say it's an indirana species so indirana is the genus say indirana so they thought of that as one but once they started taking tissue samples from frogs and they started analyzing it they realized that uh, these are different species they look similar because they occupy the same niche uh, say very fast moving streams or you know uh, wet walls that is uh, rocky walls with moss so but they were actually different species because they their genetic makeup was very different and so what suddenly has happened is that you you consider that as one now these are three species so the number of individuals per species has gone down so suddenly what we thought was abundant now you realize that one species is in large numbers but the other two that are different and they were thought to be uh, the same are now different which means there are very few individuals of that species left and suddenly a uh, one particular area which was not uh, being protected well the status of that uh, area goes up because now you understand that that frog is found nowhere else on earth and so that again the, you can then uh, to work with the government to improve protection there you can work with the communities to see how they can live alongside frogs which means they don't use pesticides which means they allow the eggs to remain they don't till a certain part of the area i mean depending on the species because there are the egg laying process and the uh the process of hatching and all are unique with different frogs so how to do this suddenly more information comes in and you can come up with solutions which are more holistic yeah then there is something but that the government does and we as wct also supported uh it for almost uh, uh, three and a half four years it's called m strike where the guards that are patrolling the forest uh they used to go randomly in different areas now they hold a gps in their hand which is nothing but your phone the phone has a software the software is recording your route so every day you walk it will tell you how many kilometers you walk every day it will tell you which are the areas you covered and that information over the next say a month is being compiled and you will have the trek walking paths of all the guards in the jungle and you will know which are those areas which the guards were avoiding because either they thought that that they can never have poaching in this place because it's very remote or it was a treacherous climb and they said oh, we will walk up we are walking let us walk for 8 hours now they may be walking for 8 hours on the same road the poachers know that then the poachers can really hunt down animals in an area which is just 500 meters away from them because they know they will never come in so that information uh has made a big difference in the way the parks are being patrolled now so that every corner of the park uh is now patrolled 
at a certain frequency, not once in two months or something. So all that is possible again because of GPS technology and that every single guard and watcher, they may not be educated, but uh, they are able to do it. So there is so much that uh, technology is assisting, but at the end of the day, um, uh, humans are not, uh, cannot be replaced when it comes to conservation. So the technology is a tool in the hand of the person who is using it and uh, it will improve efficiency. It will improve uh, the time in which you will get the answer. So it's a long answer I gave, but I, I thought it will be important to talk in one stretch. All the aspects uh, of it. So technology is a great catalyst to do conservation. Uh, and uh, coming, I mean, going forward, I, I see a lot of, uh, like you said, the startups, like you said, uh, technologists, young people who want to do uh, a project in their college to find solutions for uh, Mother Nature. For instance, robotics has a huge potential, especially looking at the oceans, because oceans, physically, it's not possible for a human being to go deep into the ocean. Most divers, recreational divers, go to, a, to 30 meters, right? The deepest point in the ocean is deeper than the tallest peak on Earth. That's Mount Everest. So Mount Everest is 8 kilometers plus. So the ocean is deeper than that. So it's impossible to understand what's happening there. So technology in that space will help. Drones can really be used. Um, not just drones currently are just going up taking pictures, but there are many more things that can happen, okay, to actually, uh, if it is predict, the paths are fixed, uh, you can actually uh, create a 3D image of the entire landscape that you're working on, could be a mountain, you could also speak volumes about how certain areas, uh, especially when you build big dams, the kind of uh, contours that get modified or roads that are cut through the mountains, uh, drone technology can come uh, to the rescue of people who understand the, the negative impact of linear infrastructure up in the mountains. So when you create those kind of things, it can visually show it to the, the decision makers that, um, you know, if you do the cost balance benefit, uh, you know, just creating employment of some water or excess uh, finally is, is, is not going to give you the kind of uh, returns because the impact of that on the mountains and the landslides and so many other things that can happen. So that, again, is something that uh, is, in, is interesting. And, uh, you know, all these geeks who write programs, they can also be of great help. Like, you know, the artificial uh, people who are working on AI, a lot of students now looking, looking at um, data analytics. Uh, there are so many colleges where your uh, pure science or things like engineering say chemical engineering or civil engineering is now mm, passe. People don't want to study that. Parents are going to the college and say, I, my, I want to, uh, you know, put my uh, kid into a, a, a degree on data and anal analytics or on AI, because that's the in thing right now. Um, while you will require basic science, so you cannot ever take the civil engineering away. AI cannot replace that. But I think that for conservation, there is a huge amount of benefit because uh, I'm sure a lot of children who are growing now and they are seeing the problems, climate change, um, forest degradation, uh, extinction rates, biodiversity loss, fire. So all these things that they are seeing uh, and the impact of that on their lives, I'm sure you will have many more young people who would want to take charge of uh, the environment. And so I think uh, AI... Uh, can become a great savior for uh, going forward in conservation. So there is a lot of things that can happen, but I think technology definitely is a, is a great tool in the hands of conservationists to make the right uh, noises and the right choices. You touched on the biotech and genetics as well, which was really nice. Um, I would like to ask you a lot more questions, but I think we've reached our, like, limit we'll just end with you telling us what you love about your job uh, in a minute if you could just give us like a summary of why you love what you do well um, i am one of those fortunate people on earth who is uh, uh, who is able to pay the rent for living on this planet you know so i i have uh, the water i drink every morning as i get up uh, or the food or the oxygen that I'm inhaling is 
largely because of this non-human uh, green planet that we have, the blue green planet, the oceans and the, and and the ecosystems on land. Um, and so through conservation, we are trying to find uh, solutions uh, that are long term, uh, scientifically vetted. Uh, also, uh, every single day, you you wake up uh, thinking about what the team is doing and how are we eventually, how, what is the actual outcome of this project going to be. So that feeling of working to um, ensure that this planet is handed over to the next generation in the same form, if it's not, not better, it gives me a lot of satisfaction. You know, sitting in Bombay, I'm talking to you in Bombay, one of the most busiest cities, and yeah. you're from my home, I'm thinking about uh, a snake in the Northeast, or if I'm thinking about a, a river dolphin uh, in Ganges in Bihar, or, uh, you know, walk, thinking about a frog that lives in the same landscape that the tiger that we study lives. And we know that because of our effort, that area is going to get declared as a national park or a sanctuary in the future. You know, it's just this opportunity to be able to look at ecosystems that are so far away from you and try and, you know, play a, you know, some catalytic role in yeah. protecting landscapes or species that most people don't even know. So they, they can really disappear from the planet with being, uh, without being detected. So that gives you a great feeling also to work with communities and inspired by people in the villages and how difficult their life is, yet their umbilical cord with Mother Nature is so intact. The culture of this country is unique. There's no other country, I think probably Nepal and Bhutan, um, I would say they also have similar culture where people revere uh, animals, people love the forest. They don't think of forests as anything outside of them to actually go and work and and work with communities uh, with their support, try and safeguard these ecosystems. It's all, you know, almost like a fairy tale for somebody who has studied uh, fluid mechanics, surface chemistry, has, he's born in Bombay and to be able to do and, and, and then, you know, uh, there is that satisfaction to actually the team when it works and we are able to either uh, you know get a place declared as a national park or a sanctuary or uh, get a corridor notified so this is something that will go much beyond your own life which means it will you know your grandchildren will actually be able to uh, go into that forest because of the work that the team and our partners have done. So that feeling is great. And yeah, I would not, uh, you know, exchange my profession with anything on earth, no matter how much money is offered to me. And this I can talk on behalf of everybody who works uh, in the Wildlife Conservation Trust. And I'm sure in other organizations, because as I told you, it's a very passion-driven field. So most people who work here are people who, who cannot be silent spectators. Well said, well said. We've spoken about so much and you've given us so many examples and vivid illustrations about what technology can do for wildlife. So thank you so much for taking the time and making this such a nice visual journey for us. So thank you, Dr. Anish, and stay tuned, everyone. We'll have a lot more on wildlife coming your way on Biotech. Thank you, Amir.